He threw a leg across that iron horse and pulled the throttle down. A million things rushing through his mind like that rumbling sound. Living life in his own eyes, direction isn't clear. So searching, searching all these years. Welcome everyone to Answer Samar's Hill. This is Pastor Ski of the Russian Wind Biker Church out in Holbrook, New York. And uh, I'm also the, uh, the New York State Elder for Bikers for Christ Motorcycle Ministry. And uh, I want to welcome everyone to the show uh, this week, a uh, brand new show. Uh, last week, last couple of weeks, I've been, uh, I've been kind of under the weather. Uh, apparently, I, uh, I was battling this, uh, this, new, this new thing that is around the coronavirus. And uh, went through my quarantine period, and I'm finally back. And uh, last night, I actually got to... Uh, Got to share in the church for the first time in a couple of weeks, and so uh, you know we're here. We want uh, we want to have some new content this week. We have a couple of questions that uh, that have come in, and uh, and I just want to share for a minute, like what's what's going on with the you know with this coronavirus thing. And you know, as um, as I spoke uh, last week, um, you know we're dealing with something right now that is really transcended uh, human history. You know, we're all uh, we're all in this uh, lockdown, and uh, it's kind of interesting. The entire world is involved in this, and uh, in my lifetime, I've never seen anything, you know, quite to this extent. And uh, you know, from uh, from the perspective of where I stand in faith, I think, you know, if we're ever going to kind of reach out uh, to see if there's a God, or if there are answers, or what's going on in this whole. Uh, human project, so to speak, you know, time is, uh, is probably prime right now. And, uh, and that's why I'm enjoying answering the questions, having dialogue. And, you know, right now, uh, people uh, are looking for hope. They're looking for answers. Um, they're looking for, for something, you know, especially right now that we're all kind of locked down. I can't even go into the studio right now because of the, you know, the, the laws and the mandates that have come down because of this, uh, this pandemic. And so I think now more than ever, it may be a time for people to, uh, to just start uh, maybe seeking what life is about. Uh, God, spirituality, uh, the questions that you've probably put off um, and put on the back burner for so long as life has kind of taken over and the business of, uh, of day-to-day routines has, has kind of put some of even the major questions on the back burner. And I think we all have an opportunity now to sit and contemplate what is real, what is true, uh, the possibilities of what's uh, what's going on, uh, particularly in this uh, this time. You know, uh, right now, right now, us out here in Long Island, uh, we're in you know the vicinity of the hotbed of this thing right now. So um, you know, I mean, I went to the store today and I had to wear wear my mask and you know stay away from people and. You know, I went to a store and there was a long line outside and they were only letting so many people in at a time. As other people left, they let more people in. And it's really an interesting time in our in our country, <clears throat> in our history. Um, and uh, like I said, now more than ever, you know, uh, we got to see if we can find some answers. And, you know, hopefully, you know, some of your questions, some of your, your, uh, your intrigue, your seeking and uh, maybe... Uh, this program, uh, what we talk about, these questions might might help you sort through some of the uh, the hard things that we we question sometimes in life. And so, um, you know, I spent a whole week last week talking about the coronavirus and you know the Christian perspective, and I don't want to, you know, just drag that on. So uh, I want to now start to get back into what the show is all about. Start to address some of your questions, some of the things that you've written in that have always been on your mind. And, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, we can reason together. And so, uh, you know, I want to invite my producer, Bobby, to kind of chime in now and uh, put himself, uh, you know, in this conversation and, and bring me some of the, uh, the questions that have come in um, from our viewers and other people about Christian faith, uh, about Jesus, about 
uh, life, whatever, whatever it is. And so, uh, so Bobby, you there? I am here. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. good. Feeling good. I'm, you know, back to uh, pretty much feeling 100%. All right. You know, going through the cold and going through uh, what probably was this virus. I did a lot of coughing, and so my uh, my throat is a, a little bit uh, raspy. Mm-hmm. I go through little bouts of a not quite laryngitis, but losing my voice here and there. But gotcha. I feel good. Well, good. Everything is vitals and everything is back to normal awesome God so uh so yeah um it was a it was an interesting ordeal went through some of the uh, the typical um symptoms you know i went through a, a couple of days several days i was short of breath to the point where i almost thought i had to go to the hospital but you know thank god god is with me mm-hmm. um whatever antibodies i had in my my system was enough to beat this thing off yeah and so uh, we're back to uh Back to uh, trying to answer some questions today. Awesome. All right. Well, glad you're feeling better and um, <clears throat> glad to have you back. So our first question is pretty, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty generic, but it's really deep. I'm, so uh, our viewer wants to know, what's so special about Jesus? What's so special <laughs> about Jesus? Well, I think that's probably the... the uh, the premier question of the Christian faith, mm-hmm. you know, as, as uh, you know, in the Christian belief, we believe Jesus is the, the only way, the only connection, uh, that we can have to God. Uh, we hear that from Jesus and, you know, through several scriptures in, in the Bible, but what makes him that? And that's, uh, that's really a question that I think is vitally important because a lot of people don't know, you know, why we make this, this, uh, this person, this one we believe to be the Son of God, so special. Why is he different than the leaders and the uh, the, um, the teachers of all other philosophies and religions? And so really briefly, and, uh, you know, it's probably bits and pieces I've covered over different shows, but um, the thing that really makes Jesus special is when you take the, the Bible as a historical document, and, um, and it has been verified as through history and the times things are written um, is documented, not just within the Bible, but the wars and the, the prophets. Uh, they lived in certain times. Their writings were documented in certain times in history. And so, um, you know, to kind of get a backdrop of why Jesus would be so special. Um, number one, there's literally um, a few hundred different bits and pieces of information that were predicted or prophesied about the life of the one that would come to be uh, the Messiah, the, uh, the savior of mankind, the one that would come to try to redeem um, humanity. And all through the scriptures of the Old Testament, there are several uh, bits and pieces of information, some that are extremely intimate. You know, uh, the town he came from, his lineage, uh, the way he would be uh, executed. Uh, you know, uh, crucifixion didn't come into, uh, into, uh, into the human way of, uh, of uh, capital punishment until hundreds of years after uh, it was explained and actually prophesied in a way by, by David in the Psalms, talking about hands and feet being pierced. And, um, and so there are so many different uh, bits and pieces of his information, uh, the time period in history um, that he would he would show up in, you know what era, what um, what dynasty that he would be here for. That's all is documented in historical prophetic writings way before Jesus came, and you know the fact that this one man actually fulfilled so many of these things would um, would in and of itself kind of led, lead to uh, some kind of indication that there's something special, that this one person that, that appeared in history um, in that time, in that, that year, and when he became prominent as a, a teacher, um, had been foretold through several people over several centuries in several different ways. Number one would, would kind of... Um, lend you to believe there's something special. The odds are astronomical. You know, um, the the number of even 14, 15 different things 
coming to fruition in one human being in one point in history is uh, an astronomical number. And so that in itself would, would tend to bring us to a kind of a place that there, there has to be something special about this, this particular man. And then, you know, you, you listen to his, his teachings and you listen to what he spoke. Um, it was kind of a new dynamic of humanity, which was really um, a reinventing of the, uh, the divine original that God had intended. You know, how we should treat each other, uh, how we view God, our relationship with God, um, compassion and love and, and how community, how society how families uh, should live was uh, a dynamic message that really brought a different, more compassionate and communal, um, really integration that really was, um, was not the way the world was at that time. And then you, you look at the way he was, was, was killed. As I said, that was all kind of prophesied and it was all uh, written long before he lived. And, um, and then, uh, you know, being, in the grave three days, you know, and there are things that um, allude to that. Jesus, when he spoke, uh, he spoke of that, the fact that he would be dead for three days. But the, the probably the most compelling thing that makes this man different, um, there's literally hundreds, maybe thousands of, of teachers, good teachers, philosophers over history. And, uh, and all of them really have been, been proven to be, to be dead, number one. And so... Um, you know, I want to cover the main point of why Jesus is so special um, after this first break. And so I want to give, uh, give a little bit of time for our sponsors to, uh, to really um, share their information. And, uh, and uh, Bobby has a chance to really share a little bit about his business and, and the studio and things that are, are going on. And so after this first break, I want to close this question with really the one thing that makes him special more than anything else and something we actually celebrated a little over a week ago. And so we'll be right back with answers from Marcel. This is Pastor Ski. We'll continue after a word from our sponsors. Hey, everybody. This is Motorcycle Mike, the personal injury lawyer. I've been riding motorcycles my entire adult life. During the course of my 30-year career as a lawyer, I've also represented countless injured motorcyclists. If you are one of them, I can be of assistance to you. Go to my website, please, MotorcycleMikeESQ.com. I'll always be there for you. I'm on your side when you ride. Welcome to Wolfman's Bike of the I'm Kenny the Wolfman Max. And right now I'm going to bring you a brand new jacket in for the ladies. An embroidered jacket that just hasn't been out yet. This is the first time. The Flying Angel. And the ever popular Brando jacket. It's been around for a hundred years. It will be around for a hundred more. I've got hundreds and hundreds in stock. Don't forget our large selection of sunglasses. I've got all types of jewelry. Ladies biker jewelry. Uh, silver rings. Hundreds of men's wranglers. We've got it all. Everything is here, right here. Wolfman's Biker Letter. 335 Smithtown Boulevard in Ron Cockerell. My phone number is 631-578-7877. 631-578-7877. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski again of the Biker Church. And just continuing on and finishing that question that, uh, that came in about what is so special about Jesus. 
And uh, uh, I talked a little bit about it before the break. But really what makes him so special, um, why we're actually still talking about him, is really the most controversial part of this Christian faith, which is really the only thing that, that really is the, the foundation and the, um, really the, uh, the backbone of what is our Christian faith. And the thing that makes Jesus so special is uh, as of yet, there's only one person who ever walked out of the grave. Um, hasn't happened before, hasn't happened afterwards. He said it would happen. Uh, it happened just the way he said it would happen. Now, believing whether that happened or not is, um, is probably going to take some level of faith. But there are several um, secular historians one in particular, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who had every reason to believe, to, uh, to doubt, and to not want Jesus to be the Messiah, actually says in his historic documents, and he's been really um, uh, commended as one of the most accurate, if not the most accurate historian of that particular time period in history. And he uh, states as a matter of fact that Jesus came back from the dead after three days. But the, um, the biggest thing that makes that credible, uh, I believe, when you, you know, sometimes we just don't want to believe something. But if we look at evidence, if we look at what transpired after an event, um, we can get an indication of the reality of that event. And so um, the people that were followers of Jesus were, were deathly afraid and they were scared to death. They went into hiding when Jesus was uh, was crucified and was killed. And um, inexplicably, uh, starting three days after, when uh, when we, we, we kind of believe and know that he walked out of the grave, all these people all of a sudden became bold about believing that Jesus was the Son of God, was the Messiah, that he did come back from the grave, uh, to the point where the vast majority of them would, would give their lives, would never denounce that. As saying it was fabricated, you know the uh, the men that followed him, um, all of them except one, was um, was martyred. Uh, John lived to an old age, but it's not that they didn't try; they tried to kill him several times. But even the fact that this faith has continued <coughs> and has lasted, um, because there's a lot of hard things that are part of this faith, you know, turning the other cheek and praying for your enemies, and and uh, you know, if you have two coats, give somebody your coat. Um, you know, and a lot of things that are hard, um, theological things that you wouldn't want to believe and you wouldn't want to do uh, as, as a human with having your own desires of a, of a faith. There's really no logical reason why this, this faith has continued out of the, the first uh, 20, 30, 40 years unless Jesus walked out of the grave. And, uh, you know, on top of all the things that have kind of given credibility of that today, even people are, are healed uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. People's lives are totally transformed, you know, in a, in a flip of a switch. Um, there are so many evidences that something incredible happened that day. And if that actually happened, then Jesus is not just so special. He is the most special person that ever walked on the face of the earth. And that's really the backbone of this faith. And so that's what makes him so special. Uh, um, without him walking out of the grave, becoming that one special uh, person who would be God coming back from the dra grave. Jesus is not special. There's a lot of nice philosophers that said a lot of nice things. Um, but that one event really made him um, what we know to be the most special human being that ever walked the face of the earth. So I hope that that kind of answers that question of why we believe he's so special. Um, why he is the backbone of our faith and why, you know, we believe and out of his own words, nobody comes to the Father but through me. And so uh, that's really in a nutshell why Jesus is so special. So, uh, so Bobby, you got something else for me? I sure do. Okay. Our next question is, why is Christianity so negative and always talking about sin? Wouldn't it be much better to be positive and emphasize the goodness in mankind rather than the negative? <clears throat> well, 
in a broad sense, you know, you read that question and, um, and you look out the window and you pick up your newspaper and you go online. Um, how widespread is the goodness of mankind when you really think about it? You know, I spoke about and I kind of preached about it last night. This very thing we're dealing with, this pandemic, was created out of motivation that really accentuates the darkness of mankind. You know, you have, you know, what we believe at this point, one nation trying to outdo another nation just so they can have preeminence and be known as the nation by, by having a laboratory that is actually creating something and with the intent of possibly trying to create the vaccine and the cure for that so they can prove that they are the one that hold the, holds the keys to, to cures and vaccines and what ails humanity. And, um, and, and this is how I put it last night in my message. I said what we're living in is the realization of Frankenstein's monster. Um, you know, a nation that wanted to be known as really God. They're playing God. They created something. And, uh, you know, the ability to create is really wanting to be God. And just like in the story of the Frankenstein monster, they thought they could tame it. Um, but then it got loose. And the world is dealing with this at this point. Um, and to answer the question maybe a little better, you know, uh, um, God created us to live in goodness. And so the whole idea is to promote and to, yes, talk about it. I mean, the Bible has so much more about what life could be, the good things of life, compassion and sharing and love and community, and those that have giving to those that don't have. And, and on and on and on and all the things that would be good in humanity. But the problem is that man in, in his inception and in really the deepest parts of his heart is not, it's not a, good, a good creature. We're all selfish. We all want our piece of the pie. We all want our preeminence. We want something. We, we use people. We abuse people. We, we create situations between each other. And so really what, what the Bible talks about, you know, this thing called, uh, called sin is nothing more than, you know, an instruction manual of, of how there are things that we shouldn't do because it's to the detriment of ourselves and to all humanity and community, our families, and even society. And so, you know, it's one thing to, yeah, want to accentuate on the good, but unless you identify uh, the not good, you know, there are people that have twisted, twisted thoughts and, and twisted mentalities that what we would think is good uh, or is, is evil, they actually, in their twisted way of looking at it, they view that as good. You know, we look at some of the mass murderers that have, have uh, come over the times of history, and some of them thought they, were, they had altruistic motivations that they were doing mankind a, a favor by eliminating you know and, and there are so many things that are part of what you know um, what we have have um, have accepted and uh, you know we talk about maybe relative morality and things like that well there is no relative morality there is no relative good and bad you know there has to be an ideal and that is the things that, that this instruction manual, which we call the Bible, which we believe is the word of God, who created us to let us know everything that is good, but also to identify those things that have become inherently part of a broken humanity that are identified as those things are called sin. And all sin is, is things and, and uh, methods of thinking, how we treat people, how we view people, actions that are to the detriment of a good life, a good family, a good culture, a good society, where everybody is good and loving and caring. And so, you know, you can't, you can't have it both ways. If, if, uh, if you want to just say everything is good, you turn your, your eyes away from it and you put your, hand in, your head in the sand and, you know, like an ostrich, just if I don't see it, it doesn't exist. And unfortunately, that's what has created this expansion of darkness, expansion of 
of, of the broken things that we we that cause us to hurt each other and use each other abuse each other and even where the mind gets demented and there are terrorizing things and philosophies and, and even uh, theologies you know we can't turn our, our our blind eye to that and so the bible doesn't turn our blind eye to that it points out the good but then it points out what is not the good and actually gives the reasoning for it and so you know everybody wants to hear all the good news you know uh everybody wants to know you know, oh, and we're nice and pat ourselves on the back and, you know, be nice and just uh, encourage everyone. And um, and then what happens to the things that aren't good? Um, they don't get addressed. And when something's not addressed, it just festers and gets worse. And that's why humanity has just been spiraling um, into just more darkness and more usury and, uh, and more ways to just separate us and break us apart and break families apart and, and damage people and hurt people and kill people and so um you know you can't you can't just emphasize the good because then the problems are not being taken care of you can't have one without the other and so i hope that answered that question and you know after a, a word from our sponsors we're going to dive into another question i really enjoy that question because uh you know, people think Christians are judgmental and sin and this and that, but there's a reasoning. You know, God wants us all to, to, to have loving, caring lives and, and where everything is good. So I hope that answered that question, and we'll continue after this word from our sponsors. This is Pastor Ski, and I want to tell you about two books that I've written, uh, The Fear of Life and, uh, and No Sting. Uh, the Fear of Life is my, uh, my journey of faith and how I lived in fear for uh, close to 35 years and how God took me out of it. Uh, no Sting is about my battle with cancer and my, my victory through God over it. And if you're interested in any of these books, go to uh, barnesandnoble.com, uh, amazon.com, and also zoolonpress.com. Go to the bookstore. And again, I want to thank you for your support. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski again from the uh, Russian Biker Church out in uh, Holbrook, New York. And uh, I think Bobby's got another question from uh, from someone who uh, I don't know wrote in, called in. I don't know what the what the uh, the mode was, but uh, so Bobby, what's uh, what's the next question for me? Okay, this is an email, and um, the question is: I guess this this may pertain more to. Um, present times i'm not sure but the question is why is there no evidence of miracles performed by god none whatsoever well that's a pretty direct question yeah none whatsoever i agree <laughs> i agree <laughs> well okay first of all that's that's a pretty um it's a question that really lacks a lot of knowledge and insight um because there are literally hundreds if not thousands of unexplainable phenomena that um, you know I don't know what someone is looking for as far as the proof that God did something um, rather than think that something just happened random on its own you know um, in my my own life you know I had uh, probably about eight years ago I had uh, my heart was healed overnight and um, and what happened was I was I uh, was going for surgery and I had a stress test and I had all kinds of tests and the echocardiogram and, and uh, it came back that my heart had uh, had several blockages and uh, my heart function was uh, I think 48 um, percent heart disease I believe is what uh, the report is because I have the reports and, uh, and that was on uh, the end of a week. And uh, they needed to do a, a cardiac catheter test. 
before I could have surgery because of the other things that they they saw. And so um, I was scheduled to have a cardiac catheter test that Monday. And that Sunday, um, one of the pastors of the church here with me, uh, Pastor Jerry, uh, anointed me, prayed for me, um, that God would do something and that God might heal me. You know, uh, does God always heal? You know, God doesn't always heal. There's, there's purposes um, that are beyond just getting the, the one person back to health. Um, but anyway, um, that morning I, I woke up and I went in for my cardiac catheter test and my cardiologist, you know, uh, I don't think I was under, they give you kind of a sedative and, uh, it was supposed to take about an hour and about a half an hour, 35 minutes into it. He said, um, no, I'm done. We don't need to see any more. And he looked at me, he said, I don't, I don't understand what happened from the end of last week to now, but he said, your heart is perfectly healthy. He said, your, your heart function is up around 65%. There's no sign of blockages. There's no sign of heart disease. So, um, you know, um, I don't know what someone's looking for to say that God did something. You know, what a hand from the sky to come down or, or I don't know what. But, you know, I have, I have been part of uh, many uh, times that God has healed someone. Um, I had... I had uh, my cancer healed, but long before that, um, we had a woman that came to our Bible study that coincidentally had the same kind of cancer that I had. It was a uh, blood cancer. It was in her bones. It was in her bone marrow, and uh, she was in our Bible study, and you know, and she had been diagnosed, and had, this was not something that just came up. It was something that was progressive, and had gotten to a point. And I prayed for her that night in Bible study, and. And, uh, and the next week, she came in and she just was livid, not livid, but um, ecstatic. And she said, Ski, they said, it's gone. Everything disappeared. You know, and, um, and, and there are so many things that, you know, when someone prays in the name of Jesus Christ, if someone asks the God of the Bible to heal someone, there are so many, so many evidences, so many, um, so many times that that is actually created a miraculous moment. Um, you know, I don't know what someone needs as far as proof that God did that. Right? Um, the, uh, the medical community, the science community tends to be in a place where if they can't explain something, their answer is, well, it's just one of those things. Um, I don't know what that means scientifically. You know, I went to school for for science, I was going to go into research, you know, um, biochemistry, biomedical engineering. I know, I know what happens, what is explainable, and what is not explainable, and uh, and what is a miracle? A miracle is something that's not explainable. You know, you want to say one of those things because you want to be in this place where there's no proof of God, and so you're kind of living in a non-reality of these things happen randomly. And, uh, you know, somebody's heart, all the things get taken out that's bad in the drop of a hat. And you would rather believe that, well, that can't be a God because there is no God. Um, it's just one of those things. And so, and that's, you know, I, I just want to be blatant with, um, with that question because that person was very blatant saying there's no proof of miracles there's no proof that god intervenes um and the reality of it is that maybe one of the most ignorant statements you can actually make you know you cannot have no explanation for something but you're so hell-bent on not thinking there's a god that you would rather believe that well it's one of those things that just we can't explain um let me tell you something there's an explanation you just don't want to you don't want to deal with it and so, um, you know, I'm very adamant on that question because that is a question that is, is uh, it's ludicrous. It's ignorant. You know, someone who doesn't want to believe something, you know, and uh, it reminds me of a, a quote that I, I, I bring up every once in a while. There was a, uh, a biologist, Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize winning biologist from Harvard that made the statement that he, you know, he doesn't want to believe that there's a God. He doesn't want to believe that there's a supernatural being that created everything. 
And his words is, so I believe in something that I know is technically impossible. Um, he's a scientist who knows that the scientific explanation of evolution and the Big Bang Theory is literally impossible. But he believes that because he doesn't want to believe in God. The same ignorance that this question is really, is really showing. And so I hate to be in somebody's face, but that's a pretty ignorant question. Yeah. So anyway, Bobby, what do you got next? All right, so... <clears throat> The next question is, God wants everyone to worship and follow him, and if they don't, they burn in hell for all eternity. What does this type of attitude say about his character? By definition, he would be described as a tyrant, no? Um, God's... The, the viewpoint of God is that we were all created to live the perfect human life in the perfect human experience and to live our life with peace and love, compassion, all the things that, you know, I kind of mentioned previously in our show. Right? And so this worship, this word worship is is really something that, you know, especially people not of faith, that they have such a small view of what that actually is. You know? We tend to think that worship is nothing more than, you know, bowing down and maybe lifting our hands and, and praising God. And, um, and we get this picture of, you know, God is just an all-powerful being that wants subservient followers worshiping him because he's just God and that's just the way it is but when you you really pay attention and pick up the book of the Bible and read about what what worship is what this faith is all about right <clears throat> every thing about our life is to be what we call a worship of God Right? God wants the best for us. And so when we believe him and we do the things that are the best for us and the best for everyone around us, creating a loving, caring, communal environment, those very actions are the worship of God. You know, when we, um, when we love someone and we take care of people and Maybe God has blessed us with income and blessed us with surplus that we can help other people or even to where we sacrifice some of our things to help those that are less fortunate, right? That is a characteristic that God wants us to live in. And by acknowledging that and stepping in that, that's actually an act of worship. And so God doesn't want just blind worshipers. He wants us to to understand his, his thought for what a great life would be, what a great society would be, what a great culture would be, and believing him to the point where we step into living our life that way, you know? And, you know, when we see, you know, we come into church and we worship God, and maybe we sing and maybe we raise our hands, and this is because we're living lives that we acknowledge that we love him for giving us the information. And this is the way our lives are playing out. That God is blessing us and blessing people through us, through us listening to what he said on how to live this life. That is our act of worship, you know? And so when we come and we praise, it's more praise. We're praising God because God has given us the information on how to have a great life, how to redeem this life how to help each other, how to live together. And so, um, you know, worship is a lot different when you really actually pick up the book and read what worship actually is than what, you know, we get a picture of this religious experience. And that is so small a part of what worship is. After we uh, take our last break, I want to continue on that a little bit because I think that's an important question on, on what worship is and why God demands worship. Anyway, when we come back from our sponsors, I want to really address that question a little more. Hey, everybody. 
everybody, this is Motorcycle Mike, the personal injury lawyer. In addition to representing injured motorcyclists for over 30 years now, during that same time, I've represented countless car crash victims and construction workers injured on construction sites. If you need my assistance, go to my website, MotorcycleMikeESQ.com. I will always be there for you. This is Pastor Ski, and I want to tell you about two books that I've written, uh, The Fear of Life and, uh, and No Sting. Uh, the Fear of Life is my, uh, my journey of faith and how I lived in fear for uh, close to 35 years and how God took me out of it. Uh, no Sting is about my battle with cancer and my, my victory through God over it. And if you're interested in any of these books, go to uh, barnesandnoble.com, uh, amazon.com, and also zoolonpress.com. Go to the bookstore. And again, I want to thank you for your support. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski again. I want to continue discussing that, uh, that question about uh, why does God want worship and why if people um, don't worship him, they're going to burn in hell. Uh, as I was saying before the break, worship is a lot more, um, more involved and more broad than what people not of the faith, people that look, at, look inside of religion from the outside and view this just as a religion and not a life experience and not a relationship uh, worship as I said is what our whole life is about you know when we have a job and this is this is in the scriptures and uh, as someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ and to kind of be who he wants us to be to the world um, we um, we are to be the best employee we can be we are to be the most ethical um, the most diligent uh, honoring that person who has given us a job whether a believer or not and, uh, and being that example in a workplace as someone who professes to follow Jesus and be a follower of God is an act of worship because we're getting to show people that uh, we believe in the, the principles and the character that God wants us to have as humans, that it's not just great for us and beneficial to us, but it's beneficial to everyone, even those who might not believe. That's also part of our worship. Right. Now, to deal with the, the last part of that question about um, if people don't worship God, that they will burn in hell for eternity. <clears throat> to understand that, understand, you have to understand that God created us as eternal beings. Okay, That's a, an important part of the reality of this existence. We're not just physical people, we're spiritual people. And um, it's not just Christians, there's a lot of philosophies that understand that we're spiritual people also. And so the whole point of this is um, when, when God created us, he created us that everything would be good. And then as the story is told, um, the deceiver came in, we made a mistake, and all of a sudden a lot of evil and you know the, the bad things are part of, part of our humanity. Um, have become ingrained in all of us. And, you know, Jesus came to kind of redeem that and this faith and to believe in him and to be changed and transformed as this Christian faith professes. You know, it's not religion. It's a, it's a change of character. It's a, it's an actual relationship with God where God changes us from the inside out. And so the whole idea of hell, see, hell was not created for, for humans. Hell was created for Satan who rebelled and the, the, uh, the fallen angels that turned on God because they don't get redemption. Because they're eternal beings and they turn so their fate is eternal. And so um, when man fell, the fall was caused by us believing the words of the deceiver. And so now we live in a realm that is broken 
and much of the things that are bad and evil and using each other and, and how we try to get over and um, ego and pride and, and coveting and, 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 you know, using people physically and, and uh, relational mess ups are part of what that evil entity brought into our realm to steal what God wanted to be good. So now where does this, this whole idea of hell come in? Um, we're eternal beings. No matter where you sit faith-wise, whether you are a follower of Jesus, whether you follow the God of the Bible, or whether you're into something else, or whether you're into nothing, you're still an eternal being. There's still a spiritual part of you that will exist forever now the whole idea of of heaven is god wants to bring humanity back to the way it should be and get rid of all the evil and get rid of all the things so that we can be together with a loving caring giving compassionate compassionate um kingdom uh, as it's described in the bible and so when people turn their life to Jesus and actually become real followers, which is a real transformation. Now their, their core is informed by the things that are good. And they want to be good, and yes, we make mistakes, but we have forgiveness and we repent and we may get better and we try to get better. But our spirit is in a place of being right with God again. And we battle what this humanity and this flesh is really... Um, really become and that's the struggle of being in faith and why are we hypocrites there's not a christian in the world that's not a hypocrite to some extent because we try but we mess up and then people look in and some people just they, they spew self-righteousness and now they they're, they're hypocrites and you know the thing is god god sees us through the eyes and through the uh, really the uh, experience of our relationship with jesus that being said um, God could not allow evil to be an eternal experience. The, uh, the nature we have in us that uses, abuses, uh, does things that aren't good for us or others cannot be um, uh, together with what is good eternally. And, and so God doesn't send anyone to hell. God doesn't send people there. It wasn't even created for them. But when we are, um, are a servant of this flesh, the dark things of the world, which whether you want to believe it or not, there are spiritual things that drag us all over the place. And so we have fights and so we argue and that's why we do evil things. And, and that's what this world is about. Um, the people that have not accepted God's answer to that, which is his son, um, are going to go with their their leader, with the one that, that they're following, and that's the deceiver and the place that was only meant for him. And so, see, uh, the Bible says in, in John, it says, uh, uh, God sent his only son that who might believe in him might be saved. Uh, God didn't send his son to condemn the world because we're already condemned. You know, this, this, this decrepit humanity cannot be allowed to be forever. You know, you go out your door and you see all the evil around you. Do you want that to be what we are? You know, that would be con con condemnation itself. And so Jesus came that we might step into something that we now in our spiritual core are righteous, are good. We struggle in this life, but once this flesh is gone, we have our, our, our spiritual identity, which now has everything that is good because the evil is in our flesh. It's all throughout the scriptures explained very, very, in very much detail. And so uh, God doesn't send us to hell for all eternity. Uh, we just choose to not step into the alternative. Um, and again, the worship uh, of, of us who follow him is just living a life that he wanted us to leave, to live. And uh, when we come into church and we, we fall on our face, so we raise our hands and we, we praise, that's praising him because he has given us the answer that we can live in this life in a much better way. And so, uh, you know, I hope that, that, that kind of gives some depth to that question. Uh, Bob, you got anything to add on that? 
I, I, t I, yeah, I agree with you on, I always felt that praising and worshiping were a little bit different, you know, and, um, I, I agree with what you said about, about praising and, and worshiping. So I know when, like, I always felt like when you're, when you're listening to Christian, you know, praise music and you know you're singing and you're in the moment and i believe that at that moment you are praising but i don't mm -hmm. i don't think that's a worshiping thing you know to me i think worshiping is much much deeper and and really giving more of yourself so would you would you agree with that um well worship is to be our whole life it's not what we do on sundays or wednesdays ex or whatever exactly else. yeah um when we praise praise is also part of worship you know because we're honoring god and we're thanking God, mm -hmm. and that's that's even a a God character to be thankful and have gratitude even to the God that has blessed us with this life, and this um, this just an incredible way to be, you know, kind of above all the dark things of this world, mm -hmm. you know. So um, you know, worship. You know, some of these these words that that religion has has kind of made, um, you know, kind of very religious. When you read the Bible, um, you know, they're, they're explained in ways that. Okay, that kind of makes sense. You know, we have this word called holy. And, uh, you know, it's like this woo, it's this spiritual, religious, Christian word of being holy. And um, and all holiness is, if you, you look in, I believe it's chapter 5 or chapter 6 of the, the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul is saying this is what would be holy. If you want to be holy, you know, if you steal, uh, stop doing that. Stop stealing from people. You know, if you're hurting people, uh, just stop doing that. Just be caring. And if you're lazy and you're abusing people, um, what would be holy would be maybe go out and get a job to support yourself and maybe even create some excess for someone else. And so really holiness, it, it has real practical meanings other than just like, like this religious perspective. And, and I think sometimes religion or churches or denominations have taken these words and made them so, so like we can't relate to them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we think of holy and sanctified and we think robes and bowing down and and, and steeples and, and all this stuff. And, you know, God is a God of just regular, regular people. And we have to understand that, you know, and so worship is just living your life in the best way you can. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think we're running out of time. And uh, you know, I thank you for joining us uh, this week. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Motorcycle Mike, Mike Levine. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kenny Wolfman Max and the, the Wolfman Leather. Obviously, Bobby, Strong on TV. Uh, strong entertainment and if anybody's out there and you're looking to do something with uh, with bands or with shows hook up with Bobby uh, great great technician uh, affordable prices and really will help you out and if anybody uh, is interested in, the, in giving to the cause of the biker church or this uh, this program you can uh, text the word give to 631-352-7773 or you can go to the Russian Wind Biker Church website RussianWindBC.org Click on donate. You can uh, dedicate whether you want it to the show or you want it to the the uh, the movement. And um, if anybody wants to check out our church, uh, we're online right now, six o'clock Sundays uh, on our Facebook page, uh, seven o'clock on Wednesdays, and Bible studies are seven thirty on Fridays. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'll see you again next week. This is Pastor Ski from the Russian Wood Biker Church, and this has been Answers from Mars Hill. God bless you all, and have a good week.